When it comes to operating a spacecraft from orbit, there are two sides that engineers have to optimize before launch. You have the software and processes involved in uplinking commands to the spacecraft, and the ones involved in downlinking telemetry. Now, the former involves making a schedule file of the commands that you want to execute, then scheduling time on a ground station which will track the spacecraft while it's within range and uplink that command file. Now, the latter requires not only receiving data once it's been downlinked and post-processing it so that way we can interpret the telemetry, but also storing those files where they can be accessed by anyone who needs them. Now, traditionally, all of these tasks are performed from a mission operations room, which can connect to the ground station or stations that you're using to send and receive data. In addition, this control room is equipped with all of the applications and tools that you need to command the spacecraft and monitor the health of all of the hardware on board. And we've all seen the exciting videos of engineers operating satellites and rovers alike from mission control. And unless you're a little bit more familiar with what goes into operations, what you may not realize is how laborious this whole process really is. Now, in addition to sending, receiving, and monitoring data, another very big part of operations is that downlinked files need their own physical storage space. So large missions, like the Perseverance rover, for example, have terabytes worth of physical hard drive space allocated to them to store everything that they expect to get from the mission. And once it's stored, files are usually organized in a database that requires software development and maintenance of its own. And all of this has to abide by ITAR or data restrictions that apply to that program. Now, diving into these areas and developing the actual code that incorporates integrity checks, communications protocols, and just in general moves data back and forth requires a lot of software development resources on top of everything else that goes into a space mission. And not everyone in the space industry has these. Now this begs the question, is there some way that we can make operations more universal and easier for spacecraft developers? Enter the world of cloud computing. Now we use this every day to store our own data. So why not apply the same concept to benefit the rapid expansion of the space industry? Well, this episode will explore that and a little bit more. So stay tuned. And with that, hello, space enthusiasts, and welcome to another episode of The Art of Space Engineering, the podcast which explores the details behind how spacecraft and payloads come together before launch and lessons learned along the way. I'm your host, Sarah Rogers, and today's episode features a conversation with Tyler Browder, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cubos, a company that is providing cloud-based mission control solutions to companies all around the world with their application Major Tom, which, may I say, is just the most wonderfully appropriate name that you could give any mission control software ever. I love it. Now, with this model of conducting mission operations through the cloud, Cubus is revolutionizing the way that operators can monitor and control their spacecraft from orbit. Now, not only does this produce resources and allow teams to operate spacecraft from literally anywhere in the world, it also provides companies with a way to share data more seamlessly with their customers. In this episode, we will go more into detail on Cubos and how it has been designed to help teams manage the operations phase. And since I had the opportunity to speak with Tyler as the CEO, the latter half of the conversation explores what it was like to take an idea for a startup company and actually bring it to fruition. This is truly a cool platform to learn about, and I can't wait to see all of the good that it does for the aerospace industry moving forward. Now, I think. This intro has built up enough suspense, so without further ado, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Tyler Browder. So you are the CEO and founder of Kubos. So what is what is your story? What made you pursue space and uh, you know the, this cloud based mission platform in the in the first place oh yeah that's a that's a long question uh there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of things to get into there uh i'll try to keep I it i can give me the spark notes version if you want to <laughs> yeah uh so uh cubos was formed in 2015 um i was previously uh just an entrepreneur i started businesses in lots of different industries um and uh i met uh one of my co-founders um, in 2015, oh, I met him in 2014, but anyway, in 2015, he came to me and said that uh, he was wanting to start a company to uh, build an open source flight software for spacecraft. Um, 
And uh, if I if you if I would join him, do the business side of things and do the sales side of things, and I said, sure, let's do it. And I had never been in the space industry, didn't know anything about satellites or CubeSats. He he came from Spire, um, so he had that background. And Spire uh, was a software engineer, and um, and so I jumped in. You know, I'm not afraid to like really uh, do things I don't know how to do, right? Uh, my my background or my credentials would not say I should own a space company, but I do. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's worked out. So that's how we got into the world, uh, into the space market, uh, doing open source fly software. Um, um, last year, we pivoted hard to this idea of cloud-based mission control software, um, which is called Major Top. Um, and we kind of shelved the fly software piece. It's still out there, open source, customers still use it, or rather users still use it. Um, but uh, right now our focus is is on the ground segment, is on operations, on TTNC. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that answered your questions as concisely as I could. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. <laughs> good, good. But yeah, no, there's... There's really like, there's so much that goes into mission control that um, I don't think anyone realizes when they, you know, first start getting into space. Like when, um, you know, just between interfacing with the ground station and then there's protocols, um, you know, if, if you have to, sure. like link encryption, all, all that stuff. So it's, it's, um, I'm sure there are many challenges associated with just kind of starting, starting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, mission control or, or TTNC is one of those things like you can't just do commanding, right? You, you got to do a little bit of all of it, right? There is some like foundational things that take some time to build and understand how they work. You know, you, you mentioned ground stations, and that's a really big thing that we do that I think is important. We, we've gone out into the market and to the commercial ground stations and integrated them in all their uniqueness uh, that makes them them what they do uh, and built a unified interface and scheduler across ground station networks. Uh, and so you can schedule on provider A and provider B um, without doing any coding. You don't have to do your own integration. We get all the data for you. So we extract it away. So you're right right now, people who whatever software they're using, they have to go interface build these interfaces, connections with the different providers. That's a huge time. It's frustrating. Uh, it's mm -hmm. difficult. Uh, it doesn't scale for, for customers. So that's really one thing that we bring um, to try to eliminate that pain point. But yeah, we so the ground segment, uh, from the ground stations, you got other applications on the ground like flight dynamics or uh, um, orbital debris that you want to track uh, or you want to be aware of. Um, and then obviously the actual protocols on the spacecraft itself, right? Um, we have to interface with those. Sometimes the decisions of the spacecraft were made well in advance usually of the mission control software. And so the control software needs to be able to be flexible and adaptable to different architectures and different protocols. So um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot, but it's, um, it's, it's really, what I really like about where we sit is you know that that relationship we build with our customers, right? They they spend a lot of time on our product, right? Interfacing with using it, really diving into it, and there's a there's a lot of trust that we build with our customers, um, and so we become quite close. We're not a kind of hands off. We we have very close relationships with our users. Yeah, no, that's that's really awesome, um, especially like dealing with uplink and downlink protocols and data, like all of that's so, so key and essential to the mission. Um, so it's, it's good to, I think it's, it's necessary to have that kind of an interface. I don't know if you could just develop like a, uh, you know, entirely hands-off kind of a deal. Yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, we're motivated, I think, to find ways to make it easier and easier for customers to, spin up and integrate Major Tom into their architecture. Um, but, you know, space likes their uniqueness, right? They like yeah. doing the, their their special thing. So we need to provide ways for them to do it. Um, we try to make that as uh, open and flexible 
and user driven as possible, meaning that they don't have to come ask us to make changes where they have the ability to change the, the way the thing functions on their own on a configuration. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a balance that we, we, <laughs> we juggle all the time. Um, so I guess before we get a little too into the weeds, can we uh, quickly back up and just kind of, could you broadly talk about like what Cubos is and mm -hmm. the, the this cloud-based mission um, yeah. platform that you guys offer and, and why that's better than the traditional interface that a lot of companies have now? Yeah, so traditionally or historically, uh, Mission Control, TTNC has been um, on premise, right? It's on a server or computer within a building um, and uh, it connects strictly to the ground station that's on top of the building. It goes straight to the spacecraft. It doesn't talk to anything else. It's a siloed data. Um, and we, we, we firmly believe that that is a bad way to operate or there's a better way, I should say, not bad versus good, but there's a, we, we, we want to improve on that. We really want to, we believe that data should be easy to integrate and exchange between different applications. So we create better processes and more efficient processes. Um, and we believe it needs to be able to scale. So an on-premise software and architecture was built for missions where you're doing one big satellite, right? And that was the only thing you're going to do for the next 10 years. Uh, that's no longer the model which we live in, right? That's not where the industry has moved to over the last 10 years. We've got smaller and smaller spacecraft and building lots of them, right? And so we're not only scaling in the number of nodes that we're talking to, we're scaling in the number of data and much data we're collecting. And so we needed uh, a way to efficiently scale that. As, a, as an industry, we need a way to efficiently scale that. We didn't need to be locked into IT infrastructures where you had to hire staff and you had to have servers and manage it. We needed a way to grow this kind of an automatically in, um, with software. And so that was the motivation that, that we needed to move to the cloud. Um, we, uh, so yeah, that, that's essentially what we're doing. We're, we're taking some traditional functionality and moving it to the cloud. Uh, so that's step one. The step two is creating new values through our integration. So I mentioned ground station partnerships that we have with ground station networks. That's a huge ecosystem that we're building. Out of the box integrations with the other services. We, we're going to move into flight dynamics, mission planning. We're going to move into orbital debris and move. Let these all be integrated with no uh, development on the user's point on the user's. Uh, uh, and so. I, that's where we're moving. And then obviously the cloud architecture that we can service. We have some customers who are spinning up new constellations, right? So they're kind of on the ground floor. Everything's being built uh, in, uh, at the same time, right? And so it's a very flexible architecture, software-driven, um, more of a modern uh, approaches to, to software development. We also have other customers who spacecraft are really old up there and they're trying to lower their costs of moving away from on-premise. So we need a flexible system that would fit into older architectures, older cust uh, prior proprietary protocols, but also move into standardized protocols. Um, and we needed a system that could do both instead of writing two different applications. So that's what the cloud through APIs, um, through our Kubernetes deployment allows us to do. That's really cool. And it's cool that people, you know, spacecraft that are up there already are trying to incorporate it. Um, as well, even though they, you know, kind of already have the um, the infrastructure, but they're they're trying to move to this more, um, I guess, more modern uh, uh, approach yeah. to things. That's, that's yeah, really cool taking that in. You know, different different customers. We have different uh, framing of our values, right? New new entities are trying to build large constellations. It's all about scale. It's about uh, spreading out our costs over time, not having the best bunch of to infrastructure of uh, uh, buying stuff off the shelf. For other customers uh, who have been around a long time, it's about cost savings, right? I have this server infrastructure. I have these uh, this uh, these bills that are associated and costs associated with this hardware from a maintenance standpoint. I have these operators on old software that doesn't, there's no way to improve it. There's no way to scale it. It's, it's no one else uses it. Right. <laughs> so it's very costly to do it. It was custom built for that one satellite. I want to build a new one, but I can't use the same. I want to use one platform. So 
about saving costs and building efficiencies that we're helping those customers. So it's same same solution, just different values that the people are looking to uh, looking at Major Tom, but also different things that we're having discussions around. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess kind of on that tangent, can we talk a little bit about um, I guess the the customer interface with Major Tom? So I. Like if, if I'm trying to, you know, give someone a visual of it, is it, um, what, what are you guys responsible for versus the, the, the customer themselves? So does the customer like kind of download, um, an application of some sort? And so they, they kind of have this finished product to just work with and kind of customize to their needs. And then you guys kind of work on upgrades and changes to it in the background or... Is it a little bit yeah. different? Yeah. So, uh, Major Tom runs in a web browser, um, so uh, it's very accessible. You could do it on your phone, though. It, I don't recommend operating a spacecraft on your phone, but you could. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we run in a web browser, which makes us uniform. It doesn't matter what computer you're running on, or you know, there is no minimum hardware requirements for us, right? And so, uh, users log into Major Tom. And so it's a web application you expect to use in anything else you're doing. Uh, so it's a modern interface. You use a, a React on the front end. It's the same thing that Facebook is built on. Uh, so it's a very dynamic, uh, 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 what you expect to see, right? And so it's very intuitive too, because you are familiar how to use web applications in our normal social lives. Um, it becomes very intuitive. So that's also help. We don't have to have these massive manuals on how to do any, you know, dig into the settings because it's very intuitive how to use it, right? You know that this plus sign over down here in the bottom means I could add things to the user interface, right? right? This is an intuitive thing instead of having to like spin up a command line to get things running. Um, and so that the interface has some configurability, some options that people can uh, use. They, they create visual dashboards, so a lot of graphing, uh, their data, so both in real time and then to uh, historical data showing, uh, so customers have long, long, big, expansive, customizable visualizations. So they can do it either in graphs or they can use this little gauge and they can use these colors and really show the data how they want to show it. But we also expose all the functionality on the uh, of Major Tom's UI that you can click and point through an API. Uh, so customers can also automate all these functionalities, right? So commanding, I wanna always send these five commands every pass, I don't have to sit there and manually click that, I can automate this so that customers can do it. But customers really could take that further and build out if they want to, really sophisticated logical integrations with their other infrastructures they have. So they have a database over here, over here is where their, their application is to actually do their image processing, right? Uh, that they're actually gonna to, wanna to use. Over here is their other, you know, VCs where they wanna show their investors their, you know, pretty satellite and the telemetry. Major Tom through these APIs can integrate and send data to all these places um, and create really this custom uh, network for your mission without having to build a whole lot of custom software. And so that's really what we're trying to do is just make it easier to interface and get data in and out of Major Tom. Um, and then uh, lastly, customers do need to write a translation layer um, to integrate with their spacecraft. So a lot of TT and C software is, um, they support certain protocols, CCSDS or CSP or whatever, um, and they have their own uh, version or, or interpretation of what that, that protocol is. And then the customer needs to fit into that um, those interpretations so that, that they can be supported and use the software. We, we take it a different approach. We're, we're protocol agnostic. We do not support any protocol natively what we do is use a WebSocket standard API to get data in and out. And you write, customers write a custom uh, translation layer from CCSDS into our WebSocket or from CSP. Uh, and customers are really like this architecture because it allows them to, this spacecraft's going to be CSP and they know their next spacecraft's going to see CSDS. They can support both of those. And from a user standpoint, inside the UI, uh, it all looks the same. We've extracted away all those differences so that, that there's a common experience 
uh, for the operator. Uh, I don't know. That may have been way too deep, but uh, that's that's what I that's what I do. Oh no, not not at all. No, that's 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 really great um, because the, at least when we were working on the the Phoenix CubeSat at ASU and and trying to implement these protocols into our uplinks and downlinks, like what we had, um, we like we developed a, a whole kind of ground application that would you know put the um, basically wrap our, our data into the, the proper protocol, um, which could then be sent to the spacecraft and then also decode everything that was coming from the spacecraft. And we didn't, some of it, um, the, the protocol we used to just to transfer data um, to and from the spacecraft and make sure that we had methods for re-requesting packets um, and, and then kind of, you know, if, if we were downlinking an image, stitching the whole image together, uh, we'd kind of customize that ourselves. So, um, so I, it's really, I, I can see how it's really important for, because it's, it's so integral to how the spacecraft works, uh, for, you know, for essentially Major Tom to, to kind of offer this, um, you know, very customizable interface. So that's, that, I think that's, that's really great. Yeah. I, yeah, you know, the funny thing about protocols that we won't use, we use protocols because we want some standardization, right? So everything can talk to everything. But the, the trouble is that protocols are, no one follows it exactly the same way. So there's always these bugs and all these tweaks. And so instead of, we just took a different approach. And I think that was something that we did. We did, well, we did it intentionally and it has worked out well for us. Um, the downside, if I if, if it's okay to talk about our downside, um, oh, well, is, <laughs> <laughs> is that we found that our users is not a safe assumption in the space industry that an operator or a space company has a software engineer on staff. Uh, it is not. It is not a safe assumption. They usually have um, electrical engineers who can write some code but they're not trained software engineers. In order to adapt, uh, to really leverage what we've done, we're trying to get away from this as best as possible, but, but having a software engineer, it doesn't even have to be experienced. That could be fresh out of college, will make this much easier to integrate our system. Um, mm -hmm. And we try to, or, and we're continuously, it's, it's part of what we're doing is making it more accessible to non-software engineers. But, um, that, that is one of the weaknesses with doing the, the architecture the way it is, is that you, mm. you need somebody to, to really leverage our system who understands software. And we're, we, we have some ideas that we're implementing right now to try to service those who don't have access to software skills that, um, but it is a, it is the, one of our weaknesses right now that we're trying to address. I don't know if I should talk about weaknesses, but I did. <laughs> oh no, no, I think that's um I you know, I, there's there's weaknesses in everything. So <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, you know, uh I believe in being transparent as possible in the space yeah. industry that's notorious for not being transparent. But I uh <laughs> I you know, I'm I'm okay with with uh, showing all my weaknesses. Um I'm aware of them and I'm addressing them as well. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of people too aren't really aware that there are some space companies that don't have software engineers. Um, yeah, it's it's I not an assumption. <laughs> yeah, it's not an assumption you can make. I mean, I mean, a lot do. It's become more mm -hmm. and more common that they do, uh, but not everyone does. Um, again, they have electrical engineers who have written some C code, um, but um, and who are familiar with embedded. Uh, uh, environments, but we run them in a web environment. That's even also new, unique. Even they do have software experience, they may not have web experience. Right. Um, and so that's another leap. So the industry is just now really starting to adopt uh, cloud solutions um, off the shelf. So um, we're part of that wave. We're really advocating for the adoption of cloud. And um, the, the rest of the world has done it. Uh, and done it successfully and has had tremendous scale and, and growth uh, by leveraging the cloud and the space industry 
lagging a little bit behind, uh, but is really starting to turn a corner over the last year or something. I think COVID has helped kick it a little bit. Um, yeah. But uh, also just Microsoft and Amazon are now into space and, and doing a lot of educating of space. And so we get the benefit from their education of the industry um, and making more uh, people open to adopting space, uh, so, uh, cloud technologies. Yeah. Yeah, my um, my training in MATLAB certainly didn't prepare me <laughs> for any kind of web web based development. Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. Um, but this is where the world's moving to, um, and we're hoping to be a big part of that um, and, and lead the way a little bit and help help customers get there. Yeah, for sure. So what we t mentioned a little bit about uh, integrating ground stations and kind of building that interface between the actual ground station and uh, Cubos. So how, I guess, how did you have to put, put that together per se? Like, uh, um, like where are all of the, did you guys just reach out to, you know, various ground stations around the world to kind of create a network um, and then just worked on, um, you know, oh, these, this ground station can handle, you know, UHF frequencies or S-band frequencies and um, has no, this hardware. How do we do that? Yeah, we take it a different approach. Okay. Um, so we partner with ground station network providers. So Microsoft Azure Orbital is a, a, is a ground station network that they're spinning up. We're one of the rollout partners. So they're offering these antennas uh, in a network uh, that you can reserve time on these antennas to downlink your data or uplink your data. Um, and we enter, are connected to that network and get exposure to their ground station. We're doing the same thing with LeafSpace, um, which is out of Europe. Um, and so you can, uh, we connect to Leaf and uh, integrate their data and scheduling APIs into Major Tom. So you can schedule through Major Tom on Leaf's network reserve whatever ground station you want or have licenses to. Uh, and then we have connected the data so that we can, um, as you downlink it on that uh, ground station, it comes into Major Tom. Uh, so as far as what frequencies and which ground stations from LEAF you need, because you may not need all of them, uh, that is a conversation that we don't get in the middle of. That's between the customer uh, or the, the satellite operator in LEAF space to identify the frequencies they need and which ground station locations are best for them. But once they've established, you know, which I'm going to use these three ground stations on my for my mission, they can then uh, tell us and we've hooked up all the interfaces so they get, they see the three ground stations uh, and they don't have to code anything. But there is a, there is, we don't get onto the licensing side of things. Uh, we don't get heavy into helping you pick and choose which ground station. Um, that is something I'm kind of interested in figuring out how to how to how to to be useful in that scenario. Not necessarily with licensing, but with the Yeah, you know ground what? Uh, licensing's not as fun. <laughs> uh, li licensing is a thing, uh, isn't it? Uh, but but you know, these are the lists of all the you know, ground stations that are on our network, regardless of vendor. You know, these are the frequencies, these are the whatever, um, and be able to provide that information to users. We're not quite there yet. Um, right now we've focused on once you've decided which ones you want to use, then we've already had those integrated so that you can use them with, you know, immediately, you know, you just spin them up. Uh, or if you already have an active mission and you want to add new ground stations to give you more capability, more passes, you don't have to actually consider the cost of integrating. We've already done that for you, right? Uh, okay. Make this faster, easier for customers. Nice. Oh yeah, because I um because I guess the the customer still has to pay the ground station provider, so that that makes a lot of sense. I'm yeah, as I got kind of used to just using the one that we had at at ASU, so it's like oh this we have to set it yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so we do support what we we call those proprietary ground stations, the ones that you own outright uh, and have full access to. Um, and so we actually allow you to use that one and supplement it with leaf space, right? If you need a couple extra passes this month because you're trying to get this data down faster, um, then you can, we have a scheduler that allows you to see all of your passes on your ground station and lease ground station when they're going to happen and schedule if you want to schedule it on leaf. Um, and aggregating this to a scheduler, schedulers basically, right? And you can see all, um, 
Azure stuff or uh, AWS's or whoever's and your proprietary ground station. Okay. So another thing that always comes up with, um, you know, aerospace missions is ITAR and export control. So I was yep. really curious as to how those um, that is integrated um, into Major Tom and how you guys have to deal with like proprietary data um, or sure. if that's still mostly left up to the, the customer. And how they no, work. we, we handled that. We were right in the big middle of it. Um, so there's a couple of different ways we address this. So we about, we're about 50, 50 between the U S uh, customers and non U S customers. And so we have a U.S. deployment of Major Tom, um, where all the servers and all the data reside within the United States. And then we have a European deployment um, so that it, it resides all in Europe. Um, and so we keep the customers separate. So if you're a U.S. customer, you're going on the U.S. deployment. If you're a non-U.S. customer, you're going to go on the EU deployment. Um, past that, we also have a new a, a higher level of security for ITAR compliant customers within the U.S. Uh, so we do have a separate deployment for ITAR uh, that we are using uh, customers that they require ITAR, so they're in an ITAR cloud. At this time, we're not doing anything higher than that, like classified missions. Um, we we so we have public clouds on Europe in the U.S., and then we have a ITAR um, restricted cloud in the U.S. for U.S. customers only. Uh, we obviously implement uh, all the security protocols that we need to for data security, for encryption, for two-factor authentication. Um, uh, and we keep all customers' data separate. We can't see the data uh, unless our customer gives us permission to go see the data for some reason. Um, uh, so at any rate, that's how we handle that. Um, there was something other point I wanted to make, but I forgot what it was. So that's, that's I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'll remember it in like six hours oh, when it's- That's right. You know, that's exactly cast. right. <laughs> that's right. Um, how do you- like, I guess what what is like an ITAR cloud versus a public cloud? Is yeah, it, is it just the type of like authentication that it takes to get into it, or so it's it's not really the authentication; it's the certification from Amazon or Azure, which support both, that the servers. All the servers, it's, it's, a, it's a guarantee that all the servers are within the United States, that only people who physically have access to those servers are U.S. citizens. It's just a higher level of certification that you get from um, uh, Amazon or Azure that we run on and we support. Not all their normal web services are available on these ITAR clouds because they're physically separate data centers. Right. And so we support both. We've architected our system so that we're compatible with both. So it's a physically different separated thing. And it's this higher level of guarantee that we are compatible with it, that we are going by all the protocols necessary for ITAR and U.S. citizens. Um, yeah. And so so it's a I, public cloud is is not as restricted right and so you yeah. can free flow the the way data moves um between uh data centers but with itar it's much more restricted this is your data center this is where you live um and that way you can control it better from an itar restricted from access point of view so itar you know is really about um access to non-us citizens and so um that's that's how uh, amazon and azure have built these itar they call them government uh, clouds. Uh, there's also uh, classified clouds, which we don't run on currently because we're not, unless we've got a customer who wanted that. Um, uh, and they also have these classified clouds for people. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's really cool. I didn't, um, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of, I guess as, as things kind of, uh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> word trying to make word salad it's not not working um um you know as things just become more integrated because like you know so much of our lives is integrated into the internet already in all of these services so it's it's interesting to kind of see how other services have you know had to to supplement those kinds of things that we you know we don't we don't think about every day 
Um, we just know, yeah. oh, it goes to the cloud and the cloud is, you know, this magical thing. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it is a magical thing, but uh, at the end of the day, there still is a server somewhere uh, mm -hmm. that it, this is running off of and multiple servers somewhere. Um, and so, um, yeah, the, the, you know, the simple answer is we do support ITAR missions uh, in an ITAR cloud um, to, for our customers. So I know you guys have a lot of commercial partners, but do you have any um, partners with uh, universities as well? Because um, I, at least from, you know, some of the, the talking, the things that we've discussed so far, you know, just the, the time and the cost savings from having a service like this would be really useful for students who don't have, uh, you know, the, a major roadblock is, is usually funding for resources, um, also time <laughs> uh, uh -huh. and and the fact that it, we're still learning everything but those are whole other uh topics you know i we offer a academic version of major tom for uh yeah for universities right uh, right now we're restricted we we keep it to u.s universities right now that's not exclusive but that makes things easier from export control and all that stuff so um we we've we don't have a lot of university partners. I'll be frank with you. Uh, I would love some, you know, I would love a lot more of them. Um, the challenge has been, in my experience, while we offer this very economical, uh, academic version of Major Tom, uh, students, and I mean this very nicely, they want to learn everything and therefore they want to build everything. Uh, yeah, and so uh, <laughs> one way to learn is to build, right? Uh, and I believe that that's how I learned about the space engine. I built a company. Uh, but, uh, and so they've been a, somewhat of a challenge to get into. And uh, since I'm offering such a steep discount, has it really been worth the effort to go try to chase down these universities? I would love more universities. I think we have a great platform that 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 really blends the line between giving you something out of the box that you can spin up quickly, reducing your time, but also give you a ton of flexibility to really customize your mission and learn how to actually integrate. That's what you want. You don't want to learn how to build a web app. You want to learn how to integrate spacecraft. And that's what we are doing. Uh, and I would love to partner more with universities. I haven't had much success uh, working with them. Um, so because they want, they would, and I get it, they want to learn how to build these systems themselves so they really understand how this works. And usually uh, the best way to do that is to just build it from scratch. And, um, and that's fine. Uh, and so anyway, to, I, I, I wish I had a better, uh, better answer. Yeah, we partner with all these universities. But uh, it's really been somewhat of a challenge. Um, and again, since we, we offer, I mean, we, we give it to them for free uh, for universities for one spacecraft. Uh, so it's not a cost problem, mm -hmm. um, but there's no money in it for me. So I really have a hard time justifying going out and cold calling uh, universities. Um, but every once in a while, university comes to us and and uses Major Tom uh, or is interested in Major Tom, and I think that's great. I think it's I think it's a great tool for them. But uh, I also don't have a college degree, so I don't know if I understand the mindset of university students <laughs> very well. Uh, and so maybe that's also the problem. I'm not uh, I don't I don't know them very well. <laughs> no, I mean I, I think I think you're right. One of the reasons is that it's necessary to 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 actually develop it yourself and and really understand it. Um, and at, at least from my experience, a lot of, uh, at least like the, the mission operations, kind of, you know, visualizing, visualizing data, um, kind of developing more of like the, because we developed a ground station app and it, it ran on Linux on our computer and then the computer was hooked up to um, our, our ground station and everything um, kind of, I don't know. We just kind of developed it as as we went. We didn't really consider any other options because it was just uh, it, it was just so integral to how we were developing the spacecraft at the same time. We had to develop the the ground software and the spacecraft flight software at the same time and test them both to make sure that they worked. Um, so, but I mean, you could still do that with with Cubo. So it's. I mean, our, I think it's just a matter of yeah. I mean, I don't mean the sound 
cranky. Uh, that's what our customers do every day with their spacecraft that they're developing. But universities think that their ones is different or more special and needs to be tied closer to their, their ground software, to their flight software, even though my commercial companies are building the exact same thing. They're building their own flight software, but can use my tool. Um, and so I'd love to engage with, I would love to understand why a university would default to building them themselves instead of, you know, integrating something uh, and really leveraging something that is flight proven, that has history, that has um, being monitored and updated mm -hmm. and uh, doesn't cost anything for them. But uh, I, uh, I don't know. I don't, I, I, anyway, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 you're good. Uh, you don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. honestly, you don't sound cranky at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just, uh... I, I completely understand. Um, if, and I, I think, I'm not sure if we mentioned this, but I, I think one thing that Major Tom does is like, it does allow you to visualize your telemetry, right? In, in real time. So if you wanted to plot like the battery voltage over time, yeah. like you can see that. So that, yeah. see, in our case, that was an app we had to have someone develop entirely in Python and then have ways yeah. of, okay, so your data file looks like this. This is how you parse it and and oh. all of this stuff. And and that would have removed an entire task from someone who doesn't even have time to do that. So I um, I don't know. That, <laughs> I uh, we would have had that on Phoenix. It would have been yeah. really useful. Well, I mean, our customers can get data flowing and visualize data in about a day mm -hmm. um, is how long it takes them. Um, uh yeah. So, I mean, a day versus however long it took, you know, the students to build out this Python app um, is really the cost difference, right? Uh, or a time difference. Um, anyways, but yeah, I, you know, sorry, I don't, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's what we're trying to do is lower time. We've, you know, uh, to integrate these things, I don't know how long you've worked on your mission to build out this application and, and get it ready for flight and, you know, how long this whole process was, but we've been able to get you know, first meeting with the customer to launching with a fully integrated major Tom took four months. That's the fastest we've done it. Um, that's awesome. And they, it's so um, that's, you know, the speed that we can move even, you know, through all their, they use it all during their testing and integration testing. Um, and then they shipped it off and then we uh, launched and we were all successful in four months turnaround. We can go real fast because we're leveraging a lot of um, pre-existing tools and not having their customer have to build everything themselves. Gotcha. But anyway. So in terms of, um, I guess, interfacing with the, the customer, like what do you guys find that you have to make like a lot of, um, since every mission's unique and everyone's going to, to use Major Tom in a unique way, do you find that you have to kind of change or like tweak things with a lot of customers or is it just kind of like adding features um, so we we engage with our customers pretty regularly and, and and solicit feedback on the experience but also new features they're looking for um so we don't do much customization per customer okay. uh customers can customize it through the api as much as they like but we do do uh, feature feedback and feature scoping and development in partnership with our customers. So customer A says they want this feature and we hear it again from other customers and there's a lot of value in this particular feature. We're gonna build it, we're gonna scope it, we're gonna do some beta testing with our customers and get their feedback on it. So when we roll this out, it's a, we do it all the time. We roll out new features um, based on customers' usage and feedback. Uh, but the difference I would say is we aren't customizing for a single user. We're building features that apply to across all of our users, right? Uh, and so that's really what we want to focus on is we'll, what will add value to the biggest group of people possible, right? So we see ourselves as really a foundational piece of software for spacecraft missions, right? You need something to do this, right? Uh, there need some tool needs to perform the function that we're performing. And so we get involved in a lot of different types of missions, right? Our smallest is a PicoSat. Our largest is 2000 kilograms. Our, uh, we have constellations, we have old satellites, new satellites. Um, and so we need to build features that apply to the widest group of people. So we don't really focus on payloads per mm -hmm. se. So we're payload agnostic as well. Um, so we have IoT, imaging, communication, 
uh, all sorts of applications, scientific missions. Uh, so we need to make sure that whatever tools that we're building or features we're building applies to regardless of what your satellite does or how big your satellite is, uh, this will be useful. Uh, so that's what we really what we strive for. So is, would you say that that's one of probably the biggest challenges in, in developing this is, is trying to figure out what are those, um, you know, kind of broad features that you, you, you want to have for everyone? You know, I, I don't know if that's one of our biggest challenges. I, we have a pretty clear idea at this point. Um, what's next or what's, what's next and next and next? Uh, you, you know, what, what, we, what our customers are really wanting now. Uh, and so that's really where we're, we have a pretty clear roadmap what we're wanting. Um, uh, the challenges is just the, um, it's just, just going fast enough. Uh, you know, our customers are wanting us to go build faster than what we can keep up with, which is a great place to be. Customers want more than, uh, or want uh, things faster than we're able to deliver them. Um, and, and so that really shows the engagement from our users. Um, and so I think that's really a bigger challenge we have right now. That what not it's not what to build, uh, it's um, how fast can we build it for them. Things do go very rapidly <laughs> in terms of development, so I can see that as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, it can be. Yeah, it's a it's a constant thing right now that we're we're trying to continue to increase velocity here with our development. I guess kind of going off of that, in in terms of kind of what's next what do you see as kind of the the future of major tom and just cloud-based mission control uh in general yeah do you think it's something everyone will end up adopting or are there some cases where you know the traditional system is actually you know might be beneficial for um someone i i think i think it's i think there's always going to be I think the vast majority of the industry is going to move to the cloud. Um, you are, if you, you don't build a new Facebook when you want to have a new, you know, social media. I mean, there's, there's some default things you do. You don't build your own well when you need water. You just hook up to the city line, right? There's these access. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see us being a part of. Why would you build your own when you just spin up Major Tom really fast and you get access to all these different things? So that's really what we're trying to build um, so that ties into this ecosystem we're trying to play. Um, you could spin up Major Tom and have all these integrations done. You have your entire ground segment rolled out for you, all the interfaces, all the integrations you need. Um, there's no longer this, this mountain of work of integration that you have to do for every mission to roll out. That's the future we're wanting to do. All this stuff integrated and create an ecosystem of choice and options for you um, and lowering and lowering those barriers uh, to entry. Uh, there will be a group that, that requires on-premise software, um, particularly in national security or they need to be completely air-gapped. They aren't going to be internet connected. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can play in that environment. We have done air-gapped networks before. Um, meaning that it's hooked up to that ground station and there's no internet at all and it's just talks to this and it's a very secure environment. Um, we have tested that. We, we can run in that environment. Um, I think you lose a lot of the power of what we are <laughs> uh, by being a cloud web app, but if you, mm -hmm. we do have customers who are interested in our interfaces and some of the tooling and features we built that are unique and but need it in a, a air gap environment and we can support those so that's how we're solving it. i think the mass majority of the world of the industry is going to move to cloud-based systems um and we're going to be a part of that but there's there's a small segment that is going to always require it and we can also play in that environment yeah i um and i definitely agree too on you know more of like the the fast rollout because at least for us i'm not sure if it works the same way with with larger missions and companies that you know, have a long history of, of developing spacecraft, but at least for like our student-led CubeSat, um, a lot of our, I guess, mission control interface was really developed at the end because the spacecraft was done. And we kind of knew all of the features, at least in, in us learning um, what goes into a spacecraft and, and what are the important things that we'll want to have for operating it, like um, 
listening for certain messages, um, the ability to request and uh, re-request packets if we, you know, we don't get the whole file. Um, a lot of that was learned at the very end. So like our, a lot of our um, kind of mission control software was developed very rapidly, <laughs> kind of in parallel at the end. And, um, and I think that, you know, kind of limits the, the types of features that you can build in because now you have to just like make things as quickly and as simple as possible. Um, and so you, you know, you might, might miss things or might have to, to finish developing some things after, uh, your spacecraft's delivered and you don't really get the, the time to properly test everything out. And, um, so it's, I, I definitely see that as, um, as being really important and, and very useful for, you know, any kind of mission to, to integrate with. I, I think from my perspective, if if the if missions continue to do does, what you experience is very common. Um, software uh, mission control software is way to the end. It's always been about the spy, spacecraft. Yeah. Oh, we're buttoning it up. Oh, how do we talk to this thing uh, yeah. <laughs> when, when we launch? Uh, and so then there's this fury of activity and racing to get this done and, and integrate it. And people start making the decision like you naturally would keeping it as simple as possible, mm -hmm. straightforward, and and make it work, right, reliable. Um, and then we'll figure out the rest later. You know, I'm hopeful that, that Cubos and Major Tom can fill that gap so that it's no longer a question of making it wor just work. Because if we just continue every mission to just make it, if we're always starting back at just make it work and keeping it simple, we're never going to go forward, we're never going to create really great, interesting new ways of operating or new data or new ways of sending information uh, and really leverage software. I mean, the beauty of software in space is that we could change it after we launch it. Uh, <laughs> hardware, you can't change. It's stuck. It's static. Um, we can always be iterating, right? We can always be pushing. But if we always start back at zero uh, on our software development, then we're never going to get any further. But if we already have, if we always start at 10, Right, we already start fully formed. We could, we know it's simple and straightforward and safe and reliable. Now we can now add on all this cool stuff. Right, this is where you get into AI and machine learning and all this, all this automation and stuff. We'd actually move the ball forward and progress, innovate on software. Right now, your spacecraft's been up there six months, and you're wanting to do something new. See if you can upload new software and change the the mission a little bit and change dynamics of mission control and we can do all that right but um what you experience is very common and what we're trying to do is eliminate that experience uh so there's no longer this experience and even if you do find yourself in there you can just spin out on major tom and take care of that for you and then you can really don't have to worry about it. we look forward move forward move the ball forward and create missions uh that that pushes innovation forward you know, I really believe the next really big wave of innovation in space is going to be software driven. Um, yeah, and I, would I would fully agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Both on the spacecraft from, from being able to change dynamically, make it smarter up there using, um, you know, reprogrammable spacecraft, software defined spacecraft, but also on the ground segment, right? Really what we want to do also is like blur what is space and not space, right? It's just a network. We're just talking to nodes on a network, regardless of where it is. It could be under the ocean or in space. It could be anywhere. It's just part of a network. Major Tom gives you visibility to this network. Uh, we, from an operator standpoint, we're just trying to collect certain type of objectives and data. I don't care that it's a spacecraft on the uh, orbiting the moon, or under a submarine under the water, or an IoT device in the Sahara Desert. Like it doesn't matter; they're all communicating. Major Tom is all managing these things. That's the world I'm building. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's I I fully agree. I mean, the software is basically the entire spacecraft is um, you know how I've always seen it. Um, yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, when question i have if you have time for one more question sure um or maybe a few more how, how, how <laughs> much time you have um so you guys have now serviced several missions successfully um i'm i'm really curious to pick especially since you know you you were you are the ceo and founder um i was really curious to pick your brain on the beginnings of the company 
and kind of how it all came together. Because I, what you know, when I was a kid, it seemed like the only people who really did space were like NASA and then Northrop and Lockheed. And now there's a bunch of startups all over the place offering you know a bunch of different services. And it's been really cool to to see all of this growth within the, within the aerospace community just over the you know past decade or so alone. Um, and I, I think it kind of gives the impression that it's sort of easy. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> from from that laugh. It's uh, you know it's definitely not that way. So um, I was curious to to kind of pick your brain on it and um, understand you know what it's like having to you know you're taking this idea for company and you're putting it out to people and your people are taking a risk in in you um, providing this service. So. Um, like, yeah, what, what was that like to kind of go out and market it and then try to, to really convince people that what you had was, you know, worth, worth the investment? Sure. Yeah. It's a great question. Maybe that's question. a bunch of questions. And that's a, yeah, like, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we started Cubos again with a different product, a different focus. And so, um, happy to get into that story how do you how do you get someone to trust your flight software when you never flown flight software before uh it's a really great story major tom had a little bit easier time uh, because we had existing relationships in the industry they knew us as people um and so there was some credibility already built and so well, we got the leverage and major tom there was ways we could test it on the spacecraft without jeopardizing the spacecraft Flight software is a different thing. Um, it was a much harder sell. I was new to the industry. I didn't even know what a CubeSat was, and I was trying to sell CubeSat software. And it was a really hard place to be. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't technical. I'm not technical training. I'm not an engineer. I'm a salesperson, right? I'm a, a entrepreneur, but I, I don't know how to code. I don't know software. Um, and so, like, getting out there and talking to people. So... You know, a couple of notes on that. The space industry is filled with really smart people. Um, I don't even have a college degree. I'm not one of those smart people, but it's filled with them. Um, and I will say they are also extremely open and kind and want to educate. Uh, and so I was really open with people in the early days that I don't know a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and they were very willing to talk to me and to educate me. And so I listened and I asked a lot of questions. Most of my early sales was asking questions. Um, in fact, that's what I do a lot in sales right now is ask lots and lots of questions to better understand at the time what a CubeSat, what I remember it was like a year into it, it clicked to me what in the world a CubeSat was. Um, and it was great. Um, I also am pretty good at talking to people. Uh, and so conferences back then were a big thing. Uh, and I went to a lot of them and I just started talking and, uh, I was able to make friends with people in the industry who liked to me, but didn't know my software work, but were willing to, you know, look at it a little deeper. And we just kept taking steps and I just kept talking to people. Uh, I met one of my first ones who, who really latched on to us. I met at, uh, Cal Poly uh, at the CubeSat, uh, whatever it's called, CubeSat workshop. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that, that thing, met them there, came friends with them, and they they took a chance on us. Uh, and you just have, I mean, it's really hard. <laughs> it was really hard to get fly software, uh, flight heritage. Mm -hmm. uh, we did achieve it, but it took us years. Um uh, Major Tom had a much faster iteration. We've been able to go a lot faster, get a lot more spacecraft on it. Part of that is relationships I've built by being in the industry that, as long as I have and just mm -hmm. talking to everyone. Um, it's, it's a challenge. Um, being able to talk to people is being able to sell, sell something that doesn't exist, sell something that you don't understand um, is, you know, a skill that it's 
pretty valuable if you want to start any company in any industry um, is learn how to sell stuff that doesn't exist and you don't understand, which is really, yeah. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's what I, that's what I did. No, I mean, I, I, I think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> you actually kind of answered a question that I, I didn't ask, but was curious to ask, which was, um, you know, considering that you didn't come from an engineering background, like what was it even like to, to kind of start this and, and super intimidating. Know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, now my partner, he was super technical and he came, like I said, from Spire, um, and, uh, I would drag him along, you know, when I, you know, mm -hmm. so first meeting is, is casual and just kind of the high level, getting to know him and, you know, a little more scripted. Then we get into a second meeting that was much more technical and I, I yanked him right in and <laughs> let him talk the whole time. So, I mean, I had to have surround myself with people who were incredibly intelligent and technical. Uh, and I still do that. I'm, my team is fantastic. Um, they're all engineers. Uh, everybody's an engineer in the company. It's very common in space. And they uh, have a great backgrounds and understand this industry very well and are very supportive. Um, and I, I've caught up to, I, I understand the product and the, and, the, and the market these days really well. But um, in the early days, it was really about bringing, surrounding yourself with really smart people and technical people, being well and not being afraid to, to ask stupid questions to really spark people because most of the time they were really happy to answer them. And even if they were frustrated, they still answered them. Uh, they still gave me the <laughs> answer because that was too rude, right? They, so they uh -huh. would, even if they thought I was an idiot, they would still answer the question and then I'd become less of an idiot. And so uh, that's how you do it. Uh, and I, you know, yeah, you get a lot of, anyway, I'm just circling back to the same thing. So there you oh, go. you're good. Yeah. And uh, I mean, honestly, the things that you talk about are, I mean, they're even applicable to engineers. Uh, even yeah. with an engineering background, it still took our team years to develop Phoenix and really understand it um, and make something that would actually work in space. Yeah. Um, and even like asking questions, like a lot of, you know, I, I've seen a lot of people, and, and I myself am, am guilty of this too sometimes, is, you know, they don't ask them because they're afraid they're going to look like um, an idiot or, you know, they don't want to seem like they, they don't understand what's going on when it's sometimes it's one of the most important uh, things that you can do. Like I've heard stories where some, someone who will be new, they'll be in a meeting and they don't understand something. And they're like, well, Hey, you know, actually what is like this one thing? Like I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I, I don't understand this. And the rest of the group is just like, actually, what is that thing? <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think that's a, I think those are great lessons for anyone to learn whether you know, you're, you're in engineering and, and you're working in the space industry, or if you're, um, you know, just interested in trying to learn more. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think asking questions is, is a huge thing. Um, <laughs> also being able to just ask a few questions, get just a little information and then be able to BS about it, uh, <laughs> is also a huge, yeah. huge skill set that everyone should learn as well. Um, <laughs> enough to get you in you know to a deeper conversation and again in this industry everyone not everyone all right i met a few that aren't but for the most part they're they're kind and generous with their time and their knowledge and want to share it um and engineers as a whole for the most part like sharing right they like telling people uh the facts and telling them how describing how to do things and so you just, as someone who, who's new to the industry you just learn a ton of things and so it's it's uh, i encourage you everybody ask questions don't be afraid to look like an idiot you might you might look like an idiot that's okay too because you learn something right and that's that's the whole point of asking a question is to learn not to save face right it's a, yeah. it's a learn yeah, I always think of it as like, oh, you know, no one knows who I am or like they'll forget about it in an hour. Yeah. And so I'm just going to do it anyway. That's right. That's right. Just do it anyway. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you get lucky and it works out really well. And that's that, that's what makes it all more exciting. Absolutely. Um, one one more final question that yeah, I asked. I got, all of I got one. I got time for one more. OK, perfect. Okay. Um, so before we end, um, what is like one favorite favorite story that you like to tell uh, that's related to, um, you know, developing Cubos over the years? Uh -huh. um, <laughs> uh -huh. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, the one that 
I don't know if it's my favorite story, but it sure made an impression on me. Early, early on, 2015, um, we 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 I was we started the company in Texas, and me and my partner flew out to California to go raise money. We hadn't built a single line of code. We didn't know anything about our customers yet. We're just trying to raise some money to do this. And we got in a meeting with a very well-known CEO uh, who was an angel investor, who was looking to invest money uh, in the space. He's, I won't tell you who he is. Um, and he took a whiteboard and shredded our entire business model. Just right there in the meeting, just destroyed it. Oh my gosh. And he was kind about it, but he, he, he picked it to pieces. And I remember going back to the Airbnb and just defeated, just devastated, did not, we, everything is wrong. We had the wrong model. We had the wrong idea. We had the wrong, it was over. It was like, before we even got started, we had, it was just this, just sitting in this terrible Airbnb in San Francisco, just devastated, right? But what I like about that story is it forced us to really address the questions he brought up. Like we could either quit and give up and go home or we could solve the problem. Uh, and we solved the problem. Uh, and he ended up angel investing in us, right? We, we, we solved That's it. Awesome. We, we, we changed our business model. We changed, we answered all these things. He ended up becoming an angel investor of ours. And um, uh, that really gave us the confidence that we could take this negative feedback or this critic, critical feedback uh, and turn in the positive and respond and adapt and to reevaluate and take hard looks at ourselves and what we're doing, uh, and, you know, thicken our skin a little bit. Uh, and I think that's a pretty, pretty important lesson. And that's, that's really rememberable to me in this journey that we've been on. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, on that note, um, <laughs> I, I I think that's a, a perfect way to to end the yeah. end the podcast. Um, end the podcast. Can't talk today. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Um, but yeah, no, thank you so much for for talking with me. This was it was very awesome to to meet you and and talk with you and and learn a lot more about Cubos. And I hope this reaches more people uh, who are you know working on space mission missions of their own, and and that it, it you know gives you guys some more customers so yeah well i really appreciate the opportunity and really enjoyed the conversation any universities out there who want major tom i'll give it to you just come <laughs> talk to me uh you know uh, uh i know i really appreciate it thank you for your time and your questions um and the opportunity thank you And that's all for this week's episode of The Art of Space Engineering. Thank you all again so much for your support of this podcast. As you know, this is you know, really a side project of mine, and I consider it my way of just trying to give something back to the aerospace community. So I hope you all found this interview as insightful and enjoyable as I did. I try to make new episodes as often as I can and make the content that I share on here as useful to you as I possibly can. If you have any questions, comments, ideas for future episodes, please feel free to connect with me via email or LinkedIn. You can find both of those resources in the podcast description. If you've been enjoying this podcast and you want to support it, please share these episodes with your friends who may be interested in them. And don't forget to follow this on your favorite podcast source and on Facebook to get notifications on upcoming episodes. Here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers, Sarah. <laughs>